The altimeter registered 20,000 feet, and the four desynchronized Merlins droned and moaned endlessly, driving the big three-bladed propellers into blurred disks behind the black bulbous spinners. The huge angular wings rocked slowly as the aircraft wallowed in the thin air, and it seemed that every rivet in the airframe vibrated loosely in sympathy with the engines. Outside was bright moonlight, a bomber's moon casting its benign light across an almost cloudless sky. Angry red streaks tinged with flickering blue showed where each exhaust stub flung its hot used gases to the night air. Tiny icy blasts of freezing air coursed through the unlined, unheated and unpressurized fuselage. Inquisitive fingers of cold, insinuating their way through a hundred unknown cracks and holes in the vulnerable alloy skin of the machine. On the outside of the fuselage, the big red ochre letters read MG C, which to those who knew told of the machine squadron and purpose. She was Lancaster C. Charlie of number seven PFF squadron, a pathfinder aircraft of the Royal Air Force, based at a station named Oakington, just a few miles out of Cambridge, England. A long way behind the dipping, swaying tail plane with its egg-shaped twin fins and rudders, a ruby red glow was all that was visible of the hell she had just come through. The burning, reeking, exploding city of Hanover, Germany. At that very moment, being pounded mercilessly by the first waves of heavy bombers, throwing their cookies and SDAs, incendiaries and firebombs, through the red, green and amber target indicator flares, that cascaded in terrifying beauty over the heart of the ancient city. Below them, acres of brilliant New Haven and Wanganui ground markers beckoned the oncoming bombers like blue and white sapphires. Smoke and flames already roiled upwards from a thousand blazing buildings, whilst heavy and medium anti-aircraft guns spat their defiance at the enemy above. The instrument panel clock read 01.32 hours, the early morning of October the 9th, 1943. Inside Sea Charlie there was comparative peace. The heart-stopping flak barrage was well astern, the target had been traversed. The markers had gone down in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. Sea Charlie had done her job for the night, and her stubby nose was now pointed steadily towards home. There had been no hits on her fragile skin this trip. The engines were running sweetly, and all seemed to be going well. There was that general feeling of unwinding that is part and parcel of coming unscathed out of a heavily defended target area. Eyes were just as keen and alert as ever. Fingers still gripped turret handlebars and gun trips just as tightly. But hearts began to thump that tiny bit slower. Adrenaline flowed a little less quickly. And cramped muscles gradually began to relax their urgent rigor. Once more, good old C. Charlie had come through, and the stray thoughts of the seven men who rode inside her began to turn tentatively towards the inviting warmth of the mess. Breakfast, a cosy bed. The voice of the rear gunner came crisp and urgent through the intercom, 
snapping off such thoughts in a trice, returning them to the perilous present. Rear gunner to skipper, aircraft dead astern, looks like an 88, range about 5,000, and coming up fast. From the pilot, okay Bly, keep your eye on him. Can you see him, Tom? This last to Tom O'Sullivan, our mid-upper gunner, who hailed from Kalgoorlie in far-off Australia. Tom could not see the fighter. It was directly astern and somewhat below us, so that his view was blocked by the bulk of Sea Charlie's fuselage. But rear gunner Bly Eaton kept up his running commentary. I've got him clear now, Skip. Definitely an 88. And he's after us for sure. Coming straight for us, still dead astern. Range 5,000 and closing fast. We'll have to corkscrew. Somehow the rich Canadian accent seemed reassuring to me. The matter-of-fact tone and calm voice lent security, and I was incongruously comforted. The voice came again, metallic and remote, through the hidden wires of the intercom. Still coming in fast. We could imagine his eyes fastened on the reflector sight, watching and waiting as the image of the twin-engine Junker's night fighter grew steadily larger inside the illuminated circle. He began to call off the range as it shortened. Four thousand. 3,000. Prepare to corkscrew port. I grasped one of the brackets that projected from my instrument panel and held on tightly. As flight engineer, I was the only crew member not strapped in, and I had no wish to repeat previous painful experiences with the kind of defensive maneuver we were about to execute. As long as I live, I will never get used to this particular brand of avoiding action in a heavy bomber. It is violent and disturbing, both physically and mentally, and quite out of character with this kind of aircraft generally. As the name implies, the aircraft describes a corkscrew spiral dive, followed by a spiral climb in the opposite direction. Anything not positively fixed down becomes a missile. The stomach and entrails are firstly forced somewhere up inside the chest, then dragged way down where they never belonged, whilst all four limbs become uncontrollable flails and the brain becomes a turmoil of total disorientation. Nevertheless, the corkscrew had become a standard defensive maneuver of heavy bombers when attacked from behind by fighters, and had proved its worth in many a night combat. We waited. Again the voice, range 2000, corkscrew port, go! On my left hand side, Phil, acting instantaneously with the final word, threw on full left rudder and aileron, and thrust the heavy control column as far forward as it would go. Obediently, C. Charlie heeled over to port, stood on her nose, and began her breathtaking plunge towards the ground more than three miles below. At the same second, Bly's four Browning machine guns shuddered and racketed, spitting out more than 4,000 bullets a minute joined almost immediately by Tom's two guns in the mid-upper turret. The engines howled in protest as the propellers underloaded, and the whole aircraft vibrated and juddered madly. The noise was incredible. Streams of brightly coloured lights fled by, tracer from the guns of the Ju-88. Then all hell broke loose. There was a blinding flash, a deafening explosion, and C. Charlie staggered as if hit by a giant fist. Smoke suddenly poured from the open hatchway that led down to the bombardier's little compartment in the nose. 
and the air was thick with the acrid, choking smell of cordite. We had been hit by explosive cannon shells. No oxygen was coming through my mask and the intercom was dead, and I felt one of my hands rip the mask from my face. Phil was dragging on the control column, heaving it back into his stomach with all his strength. Opposite Rudder and Aileron and C. Charlie shook herself like a punch-drunk boxer as she began the second climbing part of the corkscrew. G-forces welded me to my seat and turned my arms to lead as we rocketed skyward. But I could feel there was something very wrong. I knew that C. Charlie was mortally wounded, that the controls had become flaccid and useless. Miraculously, she righted herself and came level, so that some semblance of normalcy returned to my body. Behind me, past the main spar, the fuselage was a sea of flame, fanned by drafts coming through from the front end. The stench of burnt cordite was overpowering. Down through the hatchway, I could see part of the bombardier station, spewing out a mixture of filthy black and brown and incredibly clean-looking white smoke. Little flames flickered orange and white through the smoke, and I knew there could be little hope for Eric, our bombardier. A quick glance through the perspex window on my right revealed the starboard main wheel hanging broken and useless from the inboard engine nacelle while streaming flames ate greedily at the surface of the wing. See, Charlie was finished. I leaned over towards the skipper to lift the earphone from his head. He was still jockeying desperately with the controls, but I could see they were not working at all. I bawled into his ear with all the voice I could muster. Hydraulics have had it. Undercard is down and gestured wildly towards the starboard side. I doubt if he heard what I said, but evidently knew what I meant, and took a quick look over his shoulder back along the fuselage. It was now an inferno, and his expression said, more clearly than words, what was in both our minds. Behind us, Tubby Reeves, the navigator, emerged from his cubbyhole making his way forwards, away from the immediate flames. I snatched the small brass fire extinguisher from its bracket on the bulkhead, and with self-preservation foremost in my mind, scrambled down the hatchway into the nose. The smoke had thinned a little, but there were flames everywhere. Eric lay spread-eagled over the escape hatch, and one look told me that he was beyond earthly help. It also told me something else. It told me that because of his inert body, there was no way we were going to get out through that hatchway. I played the thin stream of fire extinguisher liquid on some of the flames, but I might as well have tried spitting. Back through the two circular ports, I could see flames licking through the bomb bay itself, and I knew the end was very near. I could not possibly move Eric's body and to make matters worse, the aircraft was now diving steeply and beginning to spin. Panic rose within me, and I flung the extinguisher at the flames with a useless gesture. Pain from my burned hands came and went in waves, and I coughed incessantly. My eyes smarted abominably, the skin of my face feeling scorched and dry. I felt, rather than heard, another huge flashing explosion, followed closely by several smaller ones. Then there were rending sounds as the Lancaster began to break up. I was pinned to the side of the fuselage as C. Charlie spun madly. I was about ready to call it quits. Then I felt a blow on the shoulder and looking round, I saw Tubby thrusting something at me. At first, when I saw that it was a small axe, I thought he'd gone mad. 
But then I realized that he'd been thinking more clearly than I, and I knew what he wanted me to do. On the nose of a Lancaster, there is a kind of bubble or dome used for observation. And if only I could cut through the metal ring that surrounded it, a man might just squeeze through. I did notice one other thing as I looked at Tubby. He was not wearing his parachute on his chest. At the time, this disturbed me greatly, and I wanted to let him know. But I turned my head instead towards the only way out. Somehow I moved, clawing my way towards the nose, raw hands snatching at the many projecting pieces of metal on the fuselage side, the agony of burning again forgotten in the urgency of the moment. Then the axe was rising and falling, thudding its way through the metal ring around the dome. I had enough sense to realize that it would be no good just breaking through the acrylic plastic. The hole would be too small. The next couple of minutes were a nightmare of hitting, coughing, spitting, swearing, and, I guess, praying, until suddenly I was through. The dome disappeared from sight. Whether inside or out, I do not know. But it was replaced by an almost solid, huge gale of icy wind. Then I was inching my way out into the night, away from the fearsome flames that roared and crackled behind me. In truth, I will never know how I managed to get through that opening, bulky as I was with my full flying suits, my May West life jacket, and the Irvin chute clipped on my chest. Much, much later, as I looked at the same dome on other aircraft, I found it impossible to believe that I could have gone through. And even more unbelievable, that Tubby also came through. He was fatter than I, and save for the parachute, which I discovered later he still had in his hand when he fell away, he was dressed the same. But go through I did, and as I fell away, twisting and turning, for a few moments I was gazing directly up the fuselage. The sight was a fearful one, which I carry indelibly etched on my brain to this day. A long tunnel of roaring, seething flame, now fanned to a furnace by the hole I had made. Vivid orange and red, bright yellow flashes, and streamers of purple and white. In the circle of the opening, as if framed, appeared Tubby's head and shoulders. His leather helmet was burning, and I wanted to shout to him to take it off. Then I continued my dizzy turn and saw no more. I do not actually remember pulling my ripcord handle, but suddenly there was the rush and bustle of white silk past my face. A faint boom as the canopy opened, and a sickening jerk that threatened to remove my boots. And then I was swinging and gyrating madly, hanging on like grim death to the straps that connected my shoulders to the shrouds. For no particular reason, I remembered an old saying in the RAF. If you fail to return your ripcord handle to the parachute section after a jump, they charge you half a crown for a new one. I still do not know whether this is true or not, but at that moment, I could not have cared less about ripcords, half-crown pieces, or the RAF itself. My recollections are hazy, and I decided later that I breathed in a great deal of toxic gas from the fire and the extinguisher. I know I coughed and retched a lot. The air was freezing cold and seared its way into my lungs so that the more I coughed, the more it hurt. Of the burns on my hands, arms and back, I felt nothing. But I do remember beating feverishly at my smouldering May West 
fearing that it would spread to my parachute harness. Then I must have passed out. How long I was unconscious I do not know, but my next memory was of absolute peace and quiet. I looked around me. Far away on the horizon, a dull red semicircular glow showed where Hanover still suffered. Whilst much closer and almost below me, a smallish bonfire sent out coloured sparks. My dulled senses told me I was looking at the funeral pyre of C. Charlie. There was no cloud and no sound. The impersonal moon still shone down as if nothing had happened, bathing the earth in its calm, bluish light. For a brief moment I felt elation. I had cheated death. I was safe, not badly wounded. But then came memory of what had really happened. Here I was, a terror flieger, floating down into the enemy's country with only the clothes I wore and my tiny escape kit to call my own. My companions all dead, for all I knew. I searched the air frantically for another parachute, but saw nothing. There was really nothing to be elated about. What lay ahead of me, I had no way of telling. And indeed, that is another story. Dark shadows reached up towards me. To my fuddled mind, they looked like clouds. And it was not until my boots crashed through the top twigs that I realized I had fallen amongst trees. Instinctively wrapping my arms around my head, I tumbled through the brushing, breaking branches. My feet hit the ground with a terrific, stiff-legged jolt, knocking out what little wind I had left. And I was lying full length on the ground, sobbing for breath, coughing and retching in turn, again and again. My head ached cruelly. I could just see through my puffy, swollen, smarting eyes. And I felt the promise of long agony creeping into my hands and arms. I was 19 years old. I had made my first parachute jump.